Hi, this is Jeff Zeig. I'm the founder and the director of the Milton Erickson Foundation. Here I am in our offices in Phoenix, Arizona. This is part of a series, Stories About Milton Erickson, where I'm recounting for the camera stories about my experiences with Erickson. The first in the series were about my initial encounters with Dr. Erickson. I'd like to also give some examples of how Dr. Erickson helped me. Remember, I came as a student. I didn't come for therapy, but Dr. Erickson was inherently therapeutic, and I'm the beneficiary of many of the ways in which he was therapeutic to me. When I moved to Phoenix, it was about 1978, I had my PhD, I was a licensed psychologist. I got my license here in Arizona. Uh, but along the way, I was in graduate school, and one of the habits that I had developed is a habit of smoking a pipe. I was a uh, young psychologist pipe smoker, and it seemed to fit with my role of trying to be more mature. This was after I had my master's degree, before I had my PhD. And I was visiting Dr. Erickson. I was sitting in his garden. I was smoking a pipe. Mrs. Erickson was wheeling him to see a patient. And then it became my turn for a session. And Dr. Erickson uh, said to me in the session that he had a friend who was a pipe smoker. But the friend was awkward because he didn't know where in his mouth to put the pipe. Should he put the pipe in the center of his mouth? Should it be one millimeter to the right of center? Should it be one centimeter to the left of center? He was awkward. And the friend was awkward because he didn't know how to blow out the smoke. Should he blow the smoke up? Should he blow the smoke focus? Should he blow the smoke diffuse? He was awkward. I'm thinking, why is he telling me the story? I've been smoking a pipe, it's been a habit and a, a, a hobby that I've had. I had European pipes, I had bent pipes, straight pipes, I had a pipe rack, I had a silver lighter, I had a, a leather pouch, a custom blend of tobacco, pipe tools. It was my hobby of being a pipe smoker. And Erickson continued the story. Remember, Dr. Erickson spoke in a very slow, measured, thoughtful way. And uh, he continued the story. The friend was awkward because he didn't know how to hold the pipe. Should he support it with two fingers? Should he support it with all of his fingers? Should he bend his hand? He was awkward. And the friend was awkward because he didn't know where to put the pipe. Should he hold it in his hand? Should he put it on the table? Should he put it on the floor? Should he put it on his lap? He was awkward. And the friend was awkward because he didn't know how to light the pipe. Should he use a stick match? Should he use a wick match? Should he use a butane lighter, a, a wick lighter? Should he use a butane lighter? He was awkward. And the friend was awkward because he didn't know how to light the tobacco. Should the, should the match touch the tobacco? Should it be above the tobacco? Should it be in front of the bowl? Should it be behind the bowl? He was awkward. I, I swear to you, this story went on for a long period of time. Could have been an hour of Dr. Erickson going through iterations of different ways of being awkward. Finally, from what I know now, probably, I um, flattened my expression and I nodded and I indicated to him in some way that I got the message. Two days later, day or two later, I was driving back to the San Francisco Bay Area where I lived. I got halfway there. I remember I looked up at a, a stoplight. I thought to myself, I have no desire to smoke a pipe. I'm not a pipe smoker. I stopped. It was my decision, it was my choice, it was my initiative. There was no withdrawal. I just didn't want to smoke anymore. Now, all that Dr. Erickson did was to tell me a story, and uh, a story about being awkward. Now, pipe, awkward, pipe, awkward, pipe, awkward was said so many times, and if there was anything at that point in my life, pre-PhD, that I wanted to be, it was not to be awkward. And then what Dr. Erickson did is he used my conscious mind against my unconscious mind. Smoking was an unconscious habit. And rather than looking at smoking as a thing, he broke smoking down into a series of components. And I became hyper aware of all of the components. 
suddenly it wasn't an unconscious act to smoke a pipe. I had to be aware of how I was holding it, where I put it in my mouth, whether or not I was blowing the smoke out in a diffuse stream or a focus stream. It was no longer something easy to do. Now, Dr. Erickson never asked me, he never said to me, Jeff, do you want to stop smoking a pipe? He never admonished me, Jeff, smoking can cause lung cancer, lip cancer, tongue cancer, throat cancer. What he did was just give me an opportunity to evaluate my behavior against a new setting, a new emotional setting, against the setting of being awkward, against the setting of having the task divided into so many steps that I became hyper-conscious of each of the steps. And Dr. Erickson never asked me. He never said, Jeff, did you stop smoking? It was my choice, it was my decision, and it would be to my credit that I would decide to stop smoking. All that he did was change the emotional background a little bit, give me a chance to reevaluate my own behavior against a different emotional background. Fortunately, I was intelligent enough to do that, and uh, I, I quit. And uh, that has never been a problem for me. The issue there is also about autonomy. In traditional hypnosis, uh, it might be the case that somebody gives suggestions into a passive patient, cigarettes will smell bad, cigarettes will taste bad, and the initiative, the direction, comes from outside in, in traditional hypnosis. Erickson's approach was not to induce hypnosis, it was to elicit realizations. I had everything I needed to be a non-smoker. It was just a matter of taking those components and having an event that would crystallize those components. Think about making sugar candy. When you're making sugar candy, you have a supersaturated solution. You have a supersaturated solution that's sweet, but it's bubbling and it's threatening to make a mess. When you have a thread and you put that thread into the supersaturated solution, the resources crystallize and what has previously threatened to make a mess is now uh, something that has solidified. So the orientation of Dr. Erickson was, yes, certainly quote unquote indirect, but it was orienting toward helping people to reorganize some of the resources that they had in their mind, in their brain, in their heart, in their spirit, and stimulate those resources into play. That particular story about Dr. Erickson helping me with stopping smoking is one of my favorites, and uh, it's not a technique. It's not something that I have used repetitively with people who wanted to stop smoking. This was something that Dr. Erickson invented at the moment, and one of the credits to Dr. Erickson was that he had the impetus, the ingenuity, the creativity to develop a new technique for each patient. When Dr. Erickson turned 75, Margaret Mead, who was also 75 at the time, wrote a tribute to Dr. Erickson that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Hypnosis and said that one of the defining characteristics of Dr. Erickson was inventing a new approach for each patient not necessarily for the purpose of being creative, but more necessarily for the purpose of tailoring the technique to the uniqueness of the individual. This is Jeff Zeig, here I am in Phoenix, Arizona with stories of Milton Erickson.